So other big tectonic changes resulted in the real reorganization of the West Coast in the United States and the creation of several modern landforms. Most of this is driven by the breakup of the Farallon Oceanic Plate. Um, and the Farallon Plate doesn't exist anymore, but it used to be a very large oceanic plate that was subducting beneath North America. And we're going to watch a short video here that kind of reconstructs how the Farallon Plate actually broke up. So let's pause this for a sec. Ooh, this is one of the ones that's short but repetitive. Here we go. So I'm going to rewind. <laughs> Here's the Farallon Plate and this red jagged line is the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And you can see these teeth here. This indicates that there's subduction of the Farallon Plate, an ancient oceanic plate beneath North America. You can see the other side of the Mid-Ocean Ridge is the Pacific Plate. So this area is what we want to keep an eye on. So what happens is as the Farallon Plate, and you can see that this is about 40-ish million years ago, continues to subduct beneath North America, there comes a point about here. Oh, pause. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see if I can't back it up. Right around there, right around 30 million years ago. And you can see that a segment of mid-ocean ridge gets subducted beneath the Farallon Plate. And you can also see in this animation that the Farallon Plate at this point breaks into chunks. And the northern chunk of it is called the Juan de Fuca Plate, and the southern part of it is called the Cocos Plate. So as we continue, you're going to see something cool happen Pachoo, right around here. Whoops. When the mid-ocean ridge chunks of it get subducted, um, and you can see even more shrinking of the um, Juan de Fuca Plate here, this is the creation of the San Andreas Fault. Um, because this chunk down here is going to continue to be pushed, or, sorry, yeah, kind of northward. And um, as that continues, we have extension of that region where you have subducted mid-ocean ridge. And pause. Grandma's cooking is up next. <laughs> you can see that that mid-ocean ridge then um, migrate so that it's beneath Baja, California and Mexico. And you can see right up through that separation beneath the peninsula and Mexico here that there's a mid-ocean ridge that goes right up. And then here is the whole um, San Andreas Fault region. Further northward is where you have the Cascade Mountains right up through here. So cool. All right. So the breakup of the Farallon Plate separated it into the Juan de Fuca Plate to the north and the Cocos Plate to the south. And that's where you can see this here. So Juan de Fuca is going to create the Cascades, San Andreas Fault, Cocos Plate creates Baja California here. So the Cascade Mountains, if just to remind you from 101, here you have the Juan de Fuca Plate. The Juan de Fuca Plate, um, some geologists divide into smaller chunks too. So there's like the Gorda Plate and the Explorer Plate, but really they function exactly the same. Um, and here the black line you can see is the zone of convergence. So that's where you have your ocean trench. And then from here on over is North America. And all these red triangles are the Cascade Volcanoes, where you have subduction of the Juan de Fuca Plate, creates a volcanic arc on the continents, and these names should look familiar to you, right? Mount Rainier, most dangerous volcano in the United States, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, uh, Crater Lake, all the kind of way down into Shasta, and then up into British Columbia in Canada. So the Cascade Mountains are the result of ocean to continent convergence and subduction, where you have the Juan de Fuca Plate subducting beneath North America, begins about 30 million years ago, as soon as we have the subduction of that mid-ocean ridge segment, which is the same time that the San Andreas Fault is born, 30 million years ago, with subduction of a chunk of mid-ocean ridge, or MOR, uh, beneath North America. I'm not really sure what this shows you. Oh, here we go. This is a good one. Earthquakes are common in the Gulf of California, continuing in a fairly linear trend southeastward from the state of California. Stepping back, we see that these earthquakes define the southwestern margin of the North American plate between California and Middle America. Here, we'll focus on the Gulf of California rift zone, a divergent margin which is propagating into California. It is a transitional corridor that connects the East Pacific Rise Spreading Ridge to the south, 
with the San Andreas Fault Zone in California. Extension and strike slip faulting are causing Baja California to separate away from mainland Mexico, thereby opening the Gulf of California as though it were being unzipped. In reality, the waters of the Gulf of California hide connecting stair-stepping seafloor spreading ridges with right lateral strike slip motion on classic transform faults. This collection of faults and ridges forms a continental rift system that is tearing the Pacific Plate apart from the North American Plate. If we zoom in, we can see the processes occurring. As the lithospheric plates move apart, heat rises beneath the mid-ocean ridge. Magma forms at shallow pressures and creates new rock at the spreading ridges. The plates move away in conveyor belt-like fashion. Movement between the ridges is accommodated by transform faults where large earthquakes occur due to friction between the plates. Smaller earthquakes also occur along the ridges. Backing out to map view, we see the simplified San Andreas fault system cutting through California. As the movement of the plates continues along this plate boundary, it is forcing Baja California away from Mexico and causing Santa Barbara and San Diego to migrate northward toward San Francisco. Zooming into this smaller region for a more detailed look, we will go back 20 million years to watch how the Gulf and coastal areas developed. This animation by Tanya Atwater shows a tectonic model for the 20 million year evolution of the region, depicting the rotation of the transverse range blocks, the breakup of the continental shelf, as well as the opening of the Gulf of California as the Pacific Plate grinds northward against the North American Plate. The Baja California Peninsula, and most of southwestern California, is a remnant of the North American continent that was sheared off and moved to its present position. Earthquakes in the Gulf are more of a nuisance than a threat. However, the on-land part of this spreading ridge extends into Baja California, Mexico, and the Imperial Valley of California, where it is transitioning from ridge transform boundary to the continental boundary. This area is especially vulnerable because it's underlain by soft sediment that can shake violently during earthquakes. Scientifically, the Gulf is a classic place to study the early stages of the opening of an ocean basin. Good stuff. So here you have this abduction, I screen captured it from the Farallon plate, um, mid-ocean ridge, and then the segmentation um, and the creation of the strike slip fault. So I think what's cool about this, so here's all of Baja, California, and this is still 4 million years ago, so it's not a modern reconstruction, but this whole motion that we see here with this right lateral strike slip fault along the San Andreas Fault is really being pushed by these mid-ocean ridges, these mid-ocean ridge systems, right? If you think about it, um, everything to the left moves to the left. And so in this case, it's moving to the northwest and that's what's pushing um, this segment of the Pacific Plate to the northwest, which is kind of fun. And down here is where you have the Cocos Plate. Um, so that's how the San Andreas Fault formed for the subduction of a mid-ocean ridge of an ancient plate called the Farallon Plate. And then if we look down further south into Mexico, we see this region, which is called, which we've talked about in the last slide, it's called the East Pacific Rise. And um, here's the Cocos Plate, and this is again a remnant of the Farallon Plate. And if you continue on up, the Cocos Plate has this mid-ocean ridge system that goes down through the Gulf of California, and it creates a region called the Basin and Range Province. What they were alluding to at the end of that video is that this extension and stretching of the crust um, continues up through North America and it creates what's called the Basin and Range Physiographic Province, which is outlined here on this map. All of this stretching of the crust is just an extension of these mid-ocean ridge systems where you have divergence that is also going on beneath North America. So divergence of the mid-ocean ridge in the East Pacific Rise, which is again this mid-ocean ridge system because it's in the East Pacific and it's topographically higher, creates extensional stress um, beneath North America. So extensional stress, you tend to see um, normal faults where the hanging wall moves down and then also some structures that you learned about this semester like horse and grobbins. 
So here is a classic example of a normal fault. So here we have a simple fall trace where the hanging wall is dropping down and the foot wall is rising up. And we have in this case over 7,000 feet of offset where the Teton Mountains, the Grand Teton Mountains are created. So the upthrown block here is the foot wall and the down drop block is a region called Jackson Hole, which is culturally kind of important in uh, Wyoming. It's a kind of a crossroads for parts of the West. Um, and you can see that really nicely. And so this rift valley fill, that's just erosion of the Teton Mountains. It falls down and fills in some of this drop down block. You can see this really nicely on a physiographic um, aerial shot of the Tetons, where here's Jenny Lake. And here is where the Teton fault comes into contact with the surface. Foot wall goes up, hanging wall drops down. Good stuff. So the most extreme example of crustal extension is actually Death Valley National Park, which is in Southern California. You can probably sort of trace out the outlines here. Here is Nevada and Southern California, and this is the Mexican border here. Um, I'm gonna show you a short clip from how the earth was made. such a great series. Um, so you probably recognize this in that video clip, but the major structures in Death Valley and the Basin and Range region are horse and grobbins, where you have extensional stress, which causes normal faults to form. And then you have kind of uplift and tilting of the foot walls and erosion to fill in the valleys. So this is like Death Valley. It is part of the region, like the drop down region. Good stuff. This is not the most dynamic <laughs> of, of diagrams. Oh, I can make it bigger, sorry. Okay, so the, the basin and range is a series of grobbin. So that's the drop down portion and not all, like this isn't, as clear cut as they made it in the film. Um, but like the ranges are your horse and your grobbins, the drop down portion are your basins. Good stuff. So good times. Um, another thing that occurred as a result of some shallow subduction of the Cocos Plate is the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. So here's a map of the southwestern United States, and you can see the four corners regions of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And here's four corners. And the region outlined in black is the Colorado Plateau. There are tons of national parks along the Colorado Plateau. Um, there are, um, so here's the Colorado River, you can see. So the Grand Canyon is certainly in the Colorado Plateau. But so are, and I'm going to miss some, but there are Zion National Park, Bryce Canyon, Capitol Reef National Park, um, Arches National Park, Canyonlands National Park, Monument Valley is located like right around here as well. Um, the Glen Canyon Dam is located, oh, obviously the Grand Canyon. Um, so Petrified Forest National Park, I think, is right up through here. Um, lots of national parks. And what happened in this area is that because of some shallow subduction of the, um, not the Farallon at this point, but the Cocos Plate, I guess, um, because of a relatively fast speed of subduction, is two things happened 
and one is that some of the basement rock got pushed upwards. So remember when we talked about the Laramide orogeny, we talked about the creation of the Cordilleran batholiths. Um, and so the Sierra Nevada mountains being one of those Cordilleran batholiths. So as the um, Sierra Nevadas were uplifted, any sedimentary rock above them was eroded away. And the other piece of crust that was uplifted was the Colorado Plateau. And from there, um, the if you think about the Grand Canyon, which you'll see a picture of in just a second, the Grand Canyon is a meandering river that has these deep incised meanders, right? They're carved right into the bedrock of the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so we know that that's called river rejuvenation. That occurs when, from 101, um, that occurs when you have a river that is close to base level, so it is meandering, and then the whole region is tectonically uplifted, which pushes that those rivers far from base level again, so then you start to have down cutting through the rock and back in through eventually the bedrock below any loose sediment. And that's how the Colorado Plateau, and not the Colorado, but that's how the Grand Canyon, as well as other canyons like the San Juan Canyon and the Green River uh, Canyon were incised as a result of tectonic uplift. This is the checkers game where Grand Hello, I'm Ranger Felgenhauer, and this, a beauty too great for the eye to behold. But how is it made, and why is it here in northern Arizona and nowhere else? These are questions that visitors often ask me. Isn't it human nature to wonder about our planet's early history? I'm going to give you one perspective. In this Ranger Minute, I'm going to give you an easy way to remember how the Grand Canyon was shaped over time. All you have to remember is D, U, D, E. And to do this, I'm going to use a high-tech visual aid here to help me out. Books. The first D stands for deposition. The first 4,000 feet of rock on top that we see here, these are sedimentary rocks. Rocks deposited in ecosystems far different than what we see today. At one time, oceans came in here and covered the land with water and deposited sediments. Lots of tiny particles. And then the oceans receded and wind-blown sand sediments were deposited. Then when the oceans came back again, more sediments were deposited. Lots of different types, too. Some thick layers, some thin layers, different colors as well. Many different sediments. And these sediments solidified into the rocks. Now, I said many of these sediments were deposited underwater. I'm not underwater right now, am I? Here at Lippin Point, I'm over 7,000 feet above sea level. So if D stands for deposition, U stands for uplift. This area, known as the Colorado Plateau, which comprises the Four Corners region of the United States, lifted up high and flat. You cannot have a Grand Canyon unless the rocks lift up high and flat. And then the next D stands for downcutting. About five million years ago, along came the Colorado River. And it's this river that's singularly responsible for D down cutting. Cutting down into the Colorado Plateau, revealing millions of years of the Earth's history in the layers of these rock walls. But Ranger Felgenhauer, the river, it's, it's only about 300 feet wide. I thought I heard the Grand Canyon's over 10 miles wide. So was the river ever 10 miles wide? Nope. So what happened here? Where did the rest of the stuff go? Did a glacier come in here and scoop everything out? Nope. What about earthquakes? Separating this along massive fault lines? No. So what does that E stand for? Erosion. What kind of erosion? Wind erosion? <sighs> no. Water! Rain and ice and the freezing and thawing of snow and ice cracking these rocks, breaking them, and then gravity pulling all of this erosional debris down hill and down river, widening the canyon over time, revealing this stair-step topography that we see here today. Let's review. D, deposition. U, uplift. D, downcutting. E, erosion. I'm Ranger Felgenhauer. 
and may this curiosity that led you to click on this Ranger Minute lead you to new learning opportunities and great discoveries. Continue exploring. Come on, I hope one day to meet Ranger Felgenhauer. So great. So that's how the Grand Canyon was made, kids. Um, a little bit further from home, we have the creation of the Alpine, the Alps the, and the Himalayan Mountains, um, which are both orogenies that are the result of continent to continent collision. Um, so here we have chunks of the African plate and chunks of the Indian subcontinent that collided as they both drifted north. So when we talk about the Alps in Europe, typically people are non-geologists are referring to this uh, string of mountains. But as you can see, there's pretty much a, much a continuous string of mountains from the Pyrenees um, between Spain and France, the Alps, the Carpathian Mountains in more of Eastern Europe, um, the Caucasus Mountains as we get into um, to further east and then this extends over there's another chain of mountains here that are called the Hindu Kush and they sort of continue into the Himalayan mountains so um, people have given these mountains different names but honestly it's really just a continuous zone of continent to continent collision which is really cool so that happened during the Cenozoic and um, at least in the Himalayans are continuing to occur and obviously another huge chunk of the Cenozoic during the Age of Mammals was um, organisms like mastodons and woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, and um, they're not here anymore. So what happened to them? So uh, geologists call this the megafauna extinction because a lot of these mammals were incredibly large. And so here is one of our great diagrams where you can see... Um, a, a human for scale relative to some of the creatures that would have been alive and there were really very few I'm sorry if you can hear my dog snoring like Jack is exhausted today I'm sorry um, he had a long night of doing nothing followed by a whole day of doing nothing um, so I don't think that folks 13,000 years ago in general were about six feet tall but here you have it um, here is a giant beaver and this is absolutely terrifying I'm not gonna lie like that is like a huge ass beaver okay oh i swore i'm sorry uh, so then you have mastodons woolly mammoths there were camels in north america there were rhinos in north america there were terrifying birds and lions and giant sloths as well again so this giant sloth is like seven feet tall no thank you i know they're gentle but come on that's so the megafauna go extinct and disappear in North America and Asia between about 14 and 12,000 years ago. Oh, look at this. Remember how we started with GA for a billion years? Now we're at KYA for a thousand years ago. Totally different. So what happened? Where did these organisms go? Why did they go extinct? There are two primary hypotheses, which you'll see on the next slide. I like to call this the flow chart of death because it tells you how we got to where we are today. So at 18,000 years ago, during what's called the last glacial maximum, the climate in North America and Europe and Asia was incredibly cold, um, as you might imagine, lots of it covered with ice. Um, the megafauna were free to roam North America during this time, and there were no humans also in North America. Uh, which is an important point so and that's because they simply there's no evidence for them and then simply um the ice extended southward enough that um the distance between north america and asia was pretty great at this point so ice was blocking humans from north america but as we know climate changed and so about 14,000 years ago um we find the earth finds itself in a warmer drier climate so that certainly impacts what megafauna are eating. So if you think about the biggest of the megafauna, right, like the mammoths and the mastodons, um, and to even some extent the giant sloths and beavers, like they're herbivores. So they need a ton of food because they're humongous. But it turns out when you have climate change like this, that wildflowers, which are especially important in the diets of mammoths and mastodons, uh, they greatly decrease in abundance. And that is the basis of the megafauna food supply. So you have climate change, which re leads to environmental stress. The other thing that happens almost synchronously is that glaciers retreat enough that humans can begin to migrate from Asia into North America. And so as that happens, you have these stressed megafauna that now have a new, um, new predator 
that is introduced. So there's two hypotheses about what happened to the megafauna. And the first is that climate change created an extensive amount of environmental stress for these organisms. And the second one is referred to as Pleistocene overkill. And that's because it occurred during the Pleistocene epoch. And um, it's the idea that basically humans came to North America and overkilled the, um, because they were hunting in bands of small bands, that they overkilled um, some of these megafauna. And there's evidence for this because there have been um, carcasses of of mastodons and, and um, bones of, of some of these megafauna that have been found that still seem to have like, where you can tell that they've been killed by humans because there are um, tool marks where they were stabbed and things like that. Um, but then there's also some situations where extra meat has still been found sort of on the bones, especially like in um, some of the higher latitude areas where um, things where there's still permafrost, for example, sometimes those organisms can be preserved. Um, in reality, it was probably a, a combination of both of those factors that contributed to the mass extinction of the of the megafauna. So um, about 18,000 years ago, when the ice was much farther um, south, it's likely that lots of Kamchatka here in Russia, as well as the Alaskan Peninsula here, these are called the Aleutian Islands, um, were covered in ice. And this very narrow uh, body of water called the Bering Strait was also covered in ice. Um, and so for humans to migrate from Asia, they would have to have basically taken boats along the front of a, a massive ice sheet to get to the Gulf of Alaska over here in British Columbia where it's much more likely that as this um, ice sheet began to retreat that they could really just kind of island hop their way along until um, they got to North America. And so this is um, a little cartoon that says, so yeah, they were like megafauna were going through a lot and then uh, folks showed up and and that was really the death knell of the um, woolly mammoth. So woolly mammoths lived until about, oh, six or 7,000 years ago, um, which is kind of crazy, but they lived in some of the northernmost islands of Siberia, um, and they were probably the last known organisms, uh, the last known living um, mammoths. And so there is, in like the de-extinction community, there's still like reasonably good um, DNA where there is like lots of interest in reviving the uh, the mammoth based on um, basically genetic replication and they would have to basically alter the genes of a different elephant and um, implant an embryo into an elephant to um, make the mammoth unextinct. And so there's a whole like movement where people are buying land in Siberia to create this perfect habitat for mammoths. And it's, it's so much more complicated because it's just like what bacteria were alive when mammoths were alive and what, um, do we really know everything we need to know about their ecosystem to be able to replicate that? So anyway, super interesting um, and and possible. It turns out there's lots of other organisms that humans have resulted in the extinction of that we have better genetic material for and we probably be, have an easier time sort of doing that in the future. So guess what? That is it. That, we, that brings us to today. Um, and wow, what a journey it has been. Um, I like to end the class with this quote from John McPhee, who's one of my favorite nature writers. John McPhee is actually a sports writer, but he really likes geology. And so he hangs out with geologists and like he writes books about like a lay person's experience doing geology. So if you're ever looking for a good book, um, John McPhee's Basin and Range is a great one. And uh, I really like this quote from it because this whole semester we've been talking about geologic time. So I like this quote because it says, if you free yourself from the conventional reaction to a quantity like a million years, you free yourself a bit from the boundaries of human time. And in a way, you didn't live at all because you're so insignificant in the whole scheme of things. But in another way, you live forever because you're part of this huge cycle that has been going on. You're just the next blip in evolution. It's so cool. So this is a relatively dramatic video, um, but I like ending it because it does kind of summarize our whole class in about two minutes or so. Um, and there's too much time spent on humans, but obviously people find humans interesting because they are humans. So here we go. So here we have the Big Bang and the Solar Nebula Hypothesis and their 
there's Thea in the early Earth and the sun in the heavy bombardment period. Oh, I'm sorry, there's Thea. And our moon. And the creation of the blue oceans. And the evolution of microscopic life. Evolution of macro life, fish, amphibians, reptiles, end of dinosaurs, not avian dinosaurs, age of mammals. Humans. And the manipulation of land. The discovery of science, space travel. It's kind of crazy. So thank you for participating in this class. It has been fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Take care.